Thank you everyone very much for the love. on my Ratchet 3 review. Be sure to leave a comment to be featured in my upcoming videos, leave a like if you enjoy, and please subscribe and ring the goddamn bell to be notified every time I upload. Last but not least, a quick thank you to my patron pals Dauber underscore, Stin, Dano, Dotman, Jesse, Brian, and Angel. Now then, it's time for the climactic conclusion to the Sly Cooper franchise. Right. What started off as basically your standard level to level collectathon platformer, but oh, with sneakiness, no, no, no. went full sneaky with the series' second installment, bringing about large mission based open worlds with treasures to claim and guards to deal pain. <laughs> Things in Sly 3 remain largely the same as Sly 2. Like its predecessor, Sly 3 grips your giblets right from the start, following the Cooper gang pulling off a heist on this island alongside several new members. Wait, yeah. but I, I thought we. Well, anyway, with the help of our new delinquent pals, we make our way to- <laughs> Ow. <laughs> Hello, Dimitri. We make our way up to this mysterious vault and- uh, The jig is up. Make a run for it. I mean, wheel for it. Bentley, this is not an appropriate time to do a Joe Swanson impression. What the hell is that? Oh, God, it's got Bentley. Now it's got Sly. Sly's dying. Holy fuck! Okay, let's, uh... <laughs> Let's pump the brakes here and start over. Sly 3 is actually a flashback game. In Sly's dying moments here, he recalls meeting with the muscle of his dad's gang, Jim McSweeney. And McSweeney gave Sly directions to find a map containing the location of the Cooper Vault on Kane Island, where Sly's father Connor and all past generations of Coopers hid their fortune. However, upon arrival to the island, Sly found that the vault was under siege by the deranged Dr. M. Dr. M had actually ran with Sly's father Connor and McSweeney as, like Bentley is to the current Cooper gang, the technical specialist of their gang. As time passed, However, Dr. M felt like nothing more than a sidekick to Connor, and as such felt that the Cooper vault was his to inherit. The nutty bastard had been trying to crack the vault for years, as the only way to make it open was with the Cooper cane, which of course he doesn't have because he is simply moot. But one thing was for certain, and it's that this place was on tighter lockdown than... Uh... Fort Knox. Yeah, that works. Thanks, Sly. Getting inside the place would take precision, creativity, and moreover, it would take an army of world-class thieves. Finding and bringing together that much talent won't be easy, but to get inside the Cooper vault and collect my inheritance, I was willing to pay the price. Yeah, all right, let's do it. Let's break into that vault, man. Let's go. Uh, let's let's get her done. <laughs> let's. Ah, fuck, my PS3 froze. As I said, Sly 3 largely follows the familiar format established by Sly 2, with episodic jungle gym-esque environments with a main baddie to tackle. However, the dynamic of the story gets flipped on its head. Here, you're not trying to subdue another gang, but rather this time you're building your own pack of misfits, and bringing down the bad guys is practically a byproduct of that main objective. Because these guys aren't part of some grand overarching crew, they each feel like stronger threats. They're not simply a cog in a machine or a means to an end. They are the be-all, end-all of their own territory. They're ruthless, diabolical, and admittedly much more entertaining than guys like Rajan who had about as much personality as a slice of salami. All the character interactions in Sly 3 are more entertaining than what the rest of the franchise has to offer as well. And that says a lot because character interactions have been one of the Sly series' greatest strengths the whole way through. There's even conversation trees you have to do sometimes to try and figure out what the right thing is to say, but I purposely screw them up because I just want to hear all that zesty dialogue. Look, I got in here through an air vent. We can both use it to escape. I can't fit in no vent. You spy my macho frame. I'm packing too much sexy muscle to fit in vent like you stick to. While the already great character interactions have greatly improved, there are some changes here that detract from what Sly 2 had going for it. First of all, there are no collectibles in the hubs. No treasures, no clue bottles. No! Without them or the optional treasures you can snag for more coin, not only do you have less money for power-ups or power-ups at all, but you're also not as incentivized to explore. The world's kind of just become a place to run from point A to point B to get to your next mission marker. Granted, they're still pickpocketing, and I know this is gonna sound weird, but I don't really like how money just materializes from thin air. There was something satisfying about when you actually had to log on to ThiefNet and sell the thing rather than POOF! You have money now! I appreciate them trying to speed up the pace a little bit, but I actually like that little attention to detail. On the bright side, however, Bentley and Murray can also pickpocket this time around. With the help of his wheelchair, Bentley uses a magnetic fishing pole to reel in dough, and Murray... 
Well, Murray has a special way of doing things. As I said, pickpocketing is really your only means of making money in the game, so nearly like 80% of the way through, I still had only bought like four power-ups. And then all of a sudden, the game throws you this pirate minigame where you make ass loads of cash in five minutes at the cost of ludicrous lag. Holy shit! Which completely imbalances the whole system. Just like that, now I can buy whatever I want, so long as I do this for another 20 minutes, which I'd rather not do because one, the game is almost over now, and two, these pirate ship battles are only fun for the first 10 minutes minutes. After that, the novelty wears off and they get pretty slow and repetitive. At the end of my Sly 2 review, I mentioned how the general structure of the game can get a bit repetitive at times, having to do recon or pickpocketing missions several times with nothing much different about them. Sly 3 throws in much more variety in this entry while still offering enough Sly goodness to keep me satisfied. You've got missions where you have to lockpick, find hidden codes encrypted in paintings, use costumes to disguise yourself among guards, and this was only included because Sly's voice actor genuinely does a terrible Italian impersonation and the developers wanted to make fun of it in the game. Ever once I heard a Tony da Killa Bia. You've got the worst Italian accent I've ever heard! No offense. Also, sometimes the guards have completely different voices before you actually talk to them. It's pretty funny. What was last night's password? A few moments later. Yep, that's the password. Not to mention there's just more memorable and unique missions this time around. You've got treasure hunting, cave spelunking, biplane competitions. I could go on and on. And these are all just Sly's missions. Not only does the original squad return, but as you're recruiting new members for your band. No, guys, that joke doesn't work now. There's like seven. You, of course, get to play as them as well. For now, let's focus on the OG starting with Bentley, whose loss of the use of his legs was actually, like, the best thing that could have happened to him. You know, from, like, a gameplay standpoint, of course. <laughs> standpoint. Fucking cripple. Bentley honestly moves faster in his wheelchair than he ever did on foot. <laughs> He also has a jetpack attached to his wheelchair, which you can later upgrade with a three-burst afterburner so you can triple jump as well as glide, giving him the biggest vertical edge over anyone on the team. Or at least that would have been the case had Murray not learned the aboriginal ball form, clearing plenty of vertical gaps that he wouldn't have even come close to clearing back in Sly 2. This increased versatility and mobility puts the team on a more balanced playing field, while everybody still has their own unique strengths and weaknesses. At the end of the day, Sly's still the athletic guy, Bentley's the strategist, and Murray's the meathead, but unlike before, when you play as either Bentley or Murray, you don't feel nearly as limited by your environment. Bentley's hacking missions have also made a comeback, and they're practically unchanged from Sly 2, but he does have a really cool new gadget to fidget with here known as the Grapple Cam. This device can attach to any surface and be used to distract guards, which is useful for luring them to a specific spot, and towards the end of the game, it gets upgraded with a turret, and you can even make it self-destruct to clear out a horde of thugs. It's the absolute best. Speaking of the best, let's move on to, in my opinion, the best episode of the Sly Cooper franchise, Hazard Room. <laughs> Wait, what is this? Guys, we're three games in. Why do we have to do an obligatory tutorial? Opera Fear, here we go. This is the best episode in the franchise. So as things stand, uh... <laughs> Sorry, Bentley. Sly and Bentley are the only members of the gang as Murray left the team, blaming himself for not being able to save Bentley from the whole... <sighs> incident, and he decided to head off for Australia to undergo training in the mystical art of the dream time in an attempt to find his spiritual center. Murray's teacher sent him on a walkabout all over the world, where he's recently been sighted in Venice, Italy, home to the Italian mob boss Octavio, who fell into leadership of the local mob after his opera career came crashing down thanks to the stratospheric rise of rock and roll. But if Sly and Bentley had to get through this goon to get to Murray, then that's just what they'd do. Things kick off with Sly breaking into Venice Police HQ, suspecting that maybe Murray had been incarcerated. But when Sly pulls up to a jail cell, he mistakes that slimeball Dimitri for Murray. Dimitri? Long time no punch. See, you're still in jail. And you still a crack a box. Is that racist? I feel like that's supposed to be racist. Dimitri agrees to help find Murray if Sly can break him out. So Sly cracks the lock and distracts the guard so Dimitri can easily escape. Hello, assorted meatheads. And lady. Anyone feel like some exercise? Cooper, grab him then. And I'm out. None other than Carmelita pursues Sly, and after a bit of chit-chat, Murray pops up and helps Sly flee. Which, by the way, you even get to play as Carmelita in this game, who is overpowered as fuck. <laughs> Outfitted with her signature shock pistol and moon jump, she kicks all kinds of ass. After all, how can you miss with a reticle that big? No, seriously, Carmelita, with a reticle that big, how do you fucking miss? Murray and Sly then catch up, and it's one of the many, many wonderful scenes filled with juicy character interaction. Sorry, Sly. I walk a different path. My guru, in his wisdom, told me to lose myself and not return until the black water ran pure. 
So here I stay. You sure he didn't tell you to get lost and not come back until you cleaned out the water filter? Come on, I'm on a real spirit quest here. You may have noticed Murray's voice undergoes a bit of an attitude adjustment, dropping the whole macho superhero facade back to a more natural tone, signifying how much Bentley's injury broke him and shattered the confidence he had built up to manifest the Murray in the first place. This was most likely just a direction choice and definitely not intended that way, but it's my nice little headcanon. Octavio is of course the dirtbag behind the black water Murray was referring to, who's been pumping tar into Venice Canal so he can display his destructive capabilities to everyone at his big comeback opera recital at Carnival <laughs> to basically blackmail them into loving opera again. When it's time for the recital, Bentley challenges Octavio to a duet in an attempt to distract him, and it's one of the best things ever. <laughs> Once the duet concludes, Sly tries to drop the chandelier on Octavio's head, but Carmelita screws things up, so it's off to the races in this high-speed boat-gunning fight thing, which is pretty fun. When everyone returns to the stage safe and sound, Octavio goes on a rampage and blows up one singular house, and then punts Bentley out of his wheelchair, causing Murray to relive the same helpless trauma he did back in Paris. Murray's hesitant and doubtful at first, saying he vowed to his master to renounce all violence, but then... Oh boy. Murray! Help! That does it! I'll floss my teeth with your spine! What follows is an absolute slobber knocker between Murray and the guy. <laughs> Sly cranks open tar pits in an attempt to slow the geezer down. <laughs> You're forced into some close combat where you have to know when to pull your punches or get fucking clocked. Also, be on the lookout for Octavio singing. Overall, it's a fantastic battle and a brilliant operation altogether. Murray finally gets the closure he needed to feel like he redeemed himself not only to his friends, but also in his own eyes. And with that, the gang is back together. Again. Soon, however, it'll be a four-man band. So the trio head into the heart of the Australian outback so Murray can inform his master, the Guru, that he'd like to give up his training and return to the gang. And considering the Guru's mystic abilities, he would be a fantastic addition to the team if possible. However, when the three make it to the outback, they find that miners have ravaged the place and the Guru was nowhere to be seen. After some searching, the team find the Guru locked up above the caves, and the gang retrieve his moonstone and staff so that he can perform spooky abilities and he can break free. With his staff, the Guru can camouflage into any entity and when the enemy's back is turned, he can piggyback hijack them and basically use them to ram into anything he wants. It's awesome. Also, does anybody else think in an alternate reality Guru's theme would have worked great as Aku Aku's invincibility theme? What's also great about the second episode, or at least an interesting change, is that there's actually no leader of evil going on here. All the miners themselves are the big no-nos who need to be dealt with. One of, if not my favorite mission in the entire franchise takes place here, where the Cooper gang head out to the local lemonade bar to outdrink some miners and send them packing. When the miners accuse Bentley of cheating and rightfully so, an all-out brawl breaks out while you switch perspectives from Bentley to Sly to Murray wiping out wave after wave of miners. It's funny, it's goofy, it's destructive, and it's fucking amazing. And it all comes to a screeching halt when this guy shows up wearing the mask of Dark Earth that the miners accidentally dug up. Whenever someone dons the mask, the wearer becomes larger, more powerful, durable, and aggressive. This leads to a mini boss here, and it's not too bad, but things get really, really weird when Carmelita shows up during the gang's big heist to destroy the mask after it has repeatedly gotten away because, yeah, it can move on its own. When the plan backfires, the mask attaches itself to Carmelita, and when Bentley tries to calm her down with his darts, she just just gets bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where the only way to defeat her is for Sly to climb up her and pry the mask off. What? What day was it that all the developers at Sucker Punch got so collectively horny that they thought this was a good idea? We went from this beautiful, badass redemption arc for Murray overcoming his trauma from Bentley's accident that he felt responsible for to... This. Ah well, at least we've got the guru with us now. The next thing the crew would need to crack open the Cooper vault was an RC specialist, and luckily Flight of Fancy swoops us right back up to the quality we were back at episode 1. In an online chat room, can you tell this was made in 2005, Bentley meets Penelope, who agrees to provide the team with her skills if they can defeat her boss the Black Baron in the Aces flight competition. Considering the Cooper gang has one plane in contrast to like 30 others they'll be flying against, this results in some really fun sabotaging missions. 
Legends. There's one where you have to make a deal with the league's color commentator, none other than Dimitri, so you can retrieve the flight roster so you know who you'll be going up against, leading to you framing teams Belgium and Iceland to make it look like they have beef with each other so they'll ignore you when the fights begin. You also use the Guru to control this giant wolf out in the hills to murder some of the Baron's guards so he doesn't have as many pilots on his side for the finals. Penelope even showcases her skills here, trying to protect your hangar from Team Mugshot, and yes, I said Mugshot, this big bumbling idiot is back, but not for long as you fight him as Carmelita and then send him back to jail. Anyway, you don't necessarily play as Penelope, but more so you use her helicopter and RCXD. Her chopper is used to fucking yank these dumbasses, and her RC car is used later on, and for what it's worth, it's fine. In the final round of the Aces competition, Sly has the Baron beat, but the Pringle Man won't go down that easy, so the two decide to settle things on an even bigger plane in a round of good old-fashioned fisticuffs. When the dust literally settles, <laughs> it turns out that Penelope was actually the Black Baron the whole time, and had to create the character in order to enter the flight competition years prior due to age restrictions. But when she won and became a celebrity off the back of it, she had to retain the character. Now that the Baron's just a fat loser, she was free to join the team. With the RC specialist recruited, the crew now need their explosive expert. And Bentley's best idea was to turn to none other than... The Panda King. Yes, you know, the one that helped kill Sly's dad. Sly was understandably very hesitant of the idea, but Bentley explains that the Panda King has renounced his criminal ways and had become a greybeard spending his days meditating on High Hrothko. The team find him in a trance-like state, leading to the Guru bridging the minds of Sly and the Panda King so they can communicate telepathically. And we find the Panda King repeatedly playing the battle with Sly from years ago in his head. So you have to try and snap him out of this trance and whoa, mama, the dialogue is as delectable as ever. I hate you, Sly Cooper. You've ruined me. Ruined the Panda King. And I've hated you, but that doesn't make any of this real. Years have passed and, and we both changed. Come out of this trance. Let's meet each other as we are today and let go of who we were when this fight occurred. You are correct. Forgive me. My mind is not always my own. Once he's out of it, the Panda King explains that his daughter Jing King had been kidnapped by the almighty chicken man General Sal. Brilliant. This cock is forcing the king's daughter to marry him, so the gang agreed to help get his daughter back so long as he helped in the Cooper Vault job. And well, he definitely earns that demolition expert slot because he is one badass dude who can use his signature flame foo to smoke enemies as well as blow them to bits with fireworks. Yes, you get to use homing fireworks as a weapon. How cool is that? Very, but not as cool as the team van which somehow shows back up here after floating away on a block of ice in Canada. So Murray tries his best to bring it back to the safe house. Everybody tells him with all the guards and traps in the area, it's too dangerous, but he refuses to give up. And I love how they actually tie this in with the Panda King losing his daughter. I will never leave her behind again! Words do tear at a father's heart. Would that I had such passion when they came for my little Jing King. Fear not, brave hippo! I will destroy the spikes blocking your path. This is also a total throwback to Sly 1's Murray escort missions. How cute. While the gang does their little slideshow like always, it turns out the general actually found the safe house and stole their computer. Oh shit, what about the terabyte of pool? Leading to one of the weirdest but coolest sequences in the franchise, where the guru hoists up all these guards and different objects for Sly to maneuver across the entire map in order to reach this ancient battleground that Sal retreated to. On this bamboo battlefield, you can glide across the whole thing to thump each other. It's easily one of the coolest mechanics I've seen used in a boss battle and in general. One of my favorite boss battles ever, and it's especially enjoyable beating this guy's ass considering how much of a douche he is. But she doesn't want to marry you. She's a woman. She doesn't know up from down. What? That's what he what? said. What? I know, that's what he said. So we kick the shit out of him, and because this guy is an extra big spoonful of fuckhead, not only does the gang decide to free Jing King, but we're also gonna steal everything he owns. At least that was the plan until Murray did a cannonball into his treasure room so massive that it caused Sal's family temple to collapse. Sal is incredibly pissed, so he summons a goddamn dragon, which then swoops up Penelope, so Sly has to spire jump across the dragon's scale. Okay. Sly has to spire jump across the dragon's scales to get to its head and confront it. But I'll be honest, it's a bit of a letdown as the controls can get kind of wonky. But overall, I still enjoyed it for what it was. From here, General Sal was arrested and Jing King was freed, leading to the Panda King joining the team. However, it wasn't time to storm the Cooper Vault just yet because we still had to pay Dimitri back for helping us gain access to the flight rosters for the Aces competition in Holland. Dimitri booked the team a cruise heading for Bloodbath Bay, home to a hermit pirate town, and explained on the trip that his grandfather Remy was a deep sea diver who scavenged shipwrecks for treasure. However, his luck met an end at the hands of the pirate Black Spot Pete, who stole 
not only his treasure, but all his diving gear as well. So Dimitri wants the team's help getting the gear back. When we confront Black Cock Pete, he explains that he had the maps of the stuff stolen from him by Captain Lafui, the smartest man on the seven seas. Eventually, we steal a pirate ship and find the treasure for ourselves as well as the diving gear, but Lafui was two steps ahead of us and kidnaps Penelope and takes the gold as well. At least now we get to put Dimitri's diving skills to the test to recover some upgrades for our cannons on our ship so we can take Lafui's crew down. At first, his controls took some getting used to, but after a while, I got the hang of him and he was actually pretty fun to- HOLY SHIT THAT'S TERRIFYING! Speaking of terrifying, there had been rumors of a sea monster that the pirates refer to as Crusher, so the Cooper gang go to investigate and are greeted by a goddamn Kraken. So you have to fend off the beast with your fireworks, but after a while, the panicking runs out, so it's up to Sly to do what he can with the ship's cannons. Once Crusher's calmed down, the guru tries to enter his mind and- Shit, that didn't work. No time for mourning though, onto the operation at hand, so Sly boards the captain's ship after a hard-fought battle and pretends to surrender. He pokes at Lefui's ego in an attempt to get him to slip the location of where he's keeping Penelope. The plan works, and after Sly is made to walk the plank, he falls into Murray's raft underneath and Sly heads off to the Skull Keep to rescue her. Only it turns out that just when they thought they had outsmarted Lefui, he had actually outsmarted them. Lefui. <laughs> He's good. Bentley then lures the captain into deeper waters of the harbor where the guru and crusher emerge. How did you hold your breath that long? Bentley grabs Penelope, but then Lefui stops them dead in their tracks, leading to a duel between Lefui and Penelope. Off the back of her rescue, Bentley had won Penelope over as his girlfriend. How fucking far has this guy come, man? Dimitri then tells the gang he'd help with the Cooper vault job, even though nobody asked him to help. And, uh, I know who could use some help right now. All these memories. They just bring me back to the same place. Getting crushed to death in the fist of some genetics experiment gone wrong. Not the way I thought I'd go out. Funny, but here I am at the end and suddenly all I can think about is what a coward I've been towards Carmelita. I never took the next step. Looking at Bentley and Penelope, it's clear what life is about. If Carmelita was here, I'd tell her straight out how I feel, and quit playing around. Put our professional differences aside and see if we can make it work. But that'll never happen now. I can't take this crushing. Just let the pain stop. We're finally back in the present with Sly's cane being flung into the night by Dr. M's monstrosity. Carmelita then comes rolling in with her squad to put an end to this clusterfuck of criminal activity. But we all know she's really here to save Sly. I don't think the Sly series has ever reached such climactic highs in drama, tension, and just raw emotion as right here. It's so good. Carmelita lays the smack down on Dr. M's minions and then confronts the man himself before he sicks his creature on her again and their battle continues. Can I just say, I love Dr. M. This this guy is one despicable motherfucker. Oh, he looks just like his father. And he's just as dead. The gang finds Sly alive, but barely, and bring him back to the ship to patch him up. What follows is a collective effort from a bunch of the gang members trying to get Sly's cane back and failing. Sly eventually comes to and confronts Dr. M atop this giant whale dragonfly thing and steals the cane back. He then paraglides down to the entrance of the vault and asks that Bentley and Murray come into the vault with him. So the panicking boosts them up there in the van. <laughs> Once inside, Bentley and Murray stand guard as Sly makes his way into the vault's main chamber, and this place is astounding. As soon as you enter, you're greeted with a depiction of one of Sly's oldest known ancestors, Slight and Common, the second of Egypt. Making your way further into the cave, you're greeted with mountains of gold and the ultimate fitness test made for Coopers. It's another absolute peak for the franchise, putting so much of what you've learned over the course of three games to the best of their abilities, <laughs> along with learning more about some of Sly's most notable ancestors, as well as what they contributed to the vault. And at the end, you even learn the technique Sly's dad created, which he probably would have contributed to the Thievius Raccoonus had he not been murdered. Grinding on lasers. This is Sly Cooper goodness to the max. What comes next, however, is something I found quite stupid, to be honest. Once you clear the vault, we cut back to Bentley and Murray's perspective, and Bentley asks Murray if he ever feels like Sly treats them like sidekicks. So before Sly got his cane back, he and Dr. M got into a discussion where Dr. M revealed that he felt like Connor Cooper's inferior, and basically says that much like he 
was the real leader of Sly's dad's gang, he tries to twist it and say that Bentley is the real leader of the modern Cooper gang. And I get it, this is a concept they've subtly fooled around with a bit throughout the game. You ain't a nothing without these little guys a brain! And it's not just other people who recognize this idea, but it's an insecurity Bentley himself has wrestled with. Just the field, man. Sounds like you're jealous. Well, yeah, I, I wish I wasn't in this chair. I wish I could run on tight ropes and jump on flagpoles and all that stuff. But I can't. But here's where it falls apart. Sly nearly fucking died sacrificing himself to save you from some mutant turtle like that thing in Jimmy Neutron. Not only that, but Sly used the key to his family's sacred vault to save Bentley. He was willing to throw away everything that they'd gone through up to this point if he could save Bentley's life. So wouldn't you think this act of selflessness and love would put that doubt to rest? There's a difference between feeling inferior to someone and someone treating you as an inferior, which I don't recall Sly ever remotely doing. Thankfully, Murray reassured Bentley that that is nowhere near the truth, and decided to pound the asses of Dr. M's thugs who forced the lock on the vault door after the gang made their way in. Dr. M makes his way down as well, and he and Murray get into a meathead match. After their scuffle, Dr. M catches up with Sly in the inner sanctum and proceeds to beat the shit out of him in one damn hard boss battle. You have to unhook Dr. M's machine and then hide under some kind of vehicle where Dr. M will then attack you head on after disposing of it. Once you deliver the final blow, Carmelita somehow busts into the vault and in a desperate attempt to leave a mark on Sly after his defeat, he fires a blast at Carmelita. But Sly throws himself in the way of the blast, and from there Carmelita finishes off Dr. M. When Carmelita goes over to recover Sly, he's confused as to where he is, who he is, and who Carmelita is. Carmelita informs Sly that he's her partner, Constable Cooper, and the two book it out of there. From there, the Cooper vault caves in on itself as Dr. M doesn't even make an attempt to escape, showing just how obsessed he was with finally getting into that vault. The rest of the crew retreated and witnessed the implosion of Kane Island from afar. Following the aftermath, the team went back looking for Sly, but rather than finding him, they simply found his cane and also, like, billions of dollars. Billions. With, a B. with Sly gone, for the first time the three really went their separate ways, with Murray becoming a pro racer, and Bentley and Penelope going on to do their thing. In the epilogue, Bentley spied on Sly and saw him with Carmelita on a balcony, where Sly turned to him and gave him a wink, signifying he's full of shit. And that concludes the Sly Cooper franchise. No, really, that's it. There's nothing else. I'm gonna be honest, I've always been a Sly 2 guy. In fact, I'd say for most of my life, Sly 3 has actually been my least favorite in the trilogy. But maybe growing up and becoming an older, wiser, moose of a man has given me a greater appreciation for all the good Sly 3 does. So much so that it's now my favorite in the trilogy? Blasphemous! That is blasphemous! Now don't get me wrong, Sly 2 is a masterpiece, and of course this game has its fair share of problems. The whole Mask of Dark Earth thing definitely being one of them. There's also the lack of clue bottles and collectibles which I've expressed my grievances with. But one thing I didn't bring up yet is that sadly when it comes to playing as the new characters, you can't play as them whenever you want. I mean, Carmelita, yeah, it makes sense, since she's for the most part your opposition, and Penelope and Dimitri are very situational. But come on, you could have gotten away with being able to play as the Guru and the Panda King whenever you want. And how cool would that have been? The downsides come to a complete stop there, though, as Sly 3's got to be the funniest game in the series. How about a kiss for my show, Magnificento? My lips are warm, like red from the oven. Slow down. Remember rules one and two, both of which told you to get over yourself. Both before my magnificence. Yum, yum. Give me some. I'm gonna check on Bentley. You have fun being you. I might do the jack to the innocent, baby! And in my opinion, it's also the most authentic and heartfelt in the franchise as well. I mean, just check out the Panda King's internal struggle when he's about to go on a mission with Sly for the first time. It's some fascinating, deep shit. Cooper is a teacher of humility. We have slain his parents, yet he manages to trust us. By studying him, we will become whole. I have no desire to join with my weaker side. You are failure. I am the strength that used to be the once glorious Panda King. You are strong, and I am humble. But only through cooperation will we become the father Jing King needs. The yin and the yang? If strength were all that mattered, Sao would be an ideal son-in-law. Very well. Cooper, 
shall live. Even the villains got more meat to them. Dr. M's inferiority complex driving him insane, thinking he deserves everything every Cooper to ever existed has worked for, even going as far as to try and kill his old friend's son out of greed and jealousy. Like, what the hell? Sly 3 might have taken out some things I liked from the former, but it expanded and improved upon much of what Sly 2 already executed so well tenfold. Honor Among Thieves was an amazing end for the franchise, and rightfully solidified the legendary legacy of Sly Cooper. So while this might be the end of our adventures together, it could be the start of something even bigger. Time will tell. Literally. Cause I'm building a time machine to find out. Why would you say that? Why would you say that?